Hello, and welcome to Shakespeare in Context with Claire, part two of A Midsummer Night's Dream. In this video, I hope I will be breaking new ground in discussing geology in relation to A Midsummer Night's Dream. Part one was all Greek to me, and I would like to thank Earl Showman for help and advice. I'm glad to be more in my comfort zone with this one. Over a decade ago, I did a Bachelor of Science degree in geology. I'll be using my love of gardening and geology to find out more about Shakespeare's world. Shakespeare was a great observer of nature. He mentions hundreds of plants, of plants and flowers in his work. I'm going to concentrate on one small passage. My dad, an experienced gardener, has been quoting this line from A Midsummer Night's Dream for as long as I can remember. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. Shakespeare mentions over a hundred plants and flowers throughout the canon. I want to concentrate on the flowers mentioned in this passage. I feel that this is Shakespeare speaking. I know a bank. He has not just chosen a random assemblage, but he's seen these plants flowering together. I can imagine him sitting on a bank surrounded by flowers, closing his eyes and enjoying the fragrance wafting around him on a warm summer evening. All the plants in this bower are known for their fragrance. Some of them are particularly fragrant in the evening, and some are also known to have strange properties. Wild thyme, Thymus polytrichus, not to be confused with this Mediterranean cousin, Thymus vulgaris, commonly used in cooking, is most commonly found in southeast England, but has a scattered distribution elsewhere. It likes well-drained calcite soil, and can often be found growing in rocky areas. It flowers from June to September, forming fragrant mats. It would make a perfect bed for Titania. Wild thyme is used medicinally to improve breathing disorders. Oxlip is much more rare than its cousin the cowslip. The pale yellow flowers grow in one-sided clusters, all facing in the same direction. The dark green leaves form in a floret at the base of the plant. They are oval in shape with rounded ends, unlike the leaves of its cousin, which are more tapered. It is the county flower of Suffolk, and is rarely found outside Suffolk, Cambridgeshire and Essex. It prefers to grow in damp woods in a calcite-rich soil. It flowers in April to May. It may have antibacterial properties and was traditionally used to treat coughs and rheumatism. Today, nodding violet is the name given to a popular house plant, a native plant of Africa. But here Shakespeare is referring to the wild violet, which tends to nod its head. The viola family contains many types. Oberon refers to a flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound. The white violet that was hit by Cupid's bow became love in idleness, more commonly known as the wild pansy. The common dog violet has no scent. All the flowers that make up Titania's bower are scented, so a more likely contender is the sweet violet, which is known for its heady scent. Legend has it that you can only smell it once, then it steals your sense of smell. It does actually contain a chemical which shuts off smell receptors, but the effect is only temporary. Are red, violets are blue, goes the rhyme. The flower struck by Cupid's bow was white. Viola persicifolia, or the fen violet, is now rare in England. It prefers peaty calciferous areas. It is only found in Cambridgeshire and Oxfordshire, as much of its habitat has been drained. The seeds are able to remain dormant for long periods. They often germinate in boggy ground that has been disturbed. The churned-up ground caused by the floods in 1594 might provide perfect conditions for the little white violet in the following spring as the ground dried out a little. Violet contains salicylic acid, which is similar to the pain-relieving compound in aspirin. 
and in addition to easing headaches, it can help support restful sleep. In Greek mythology, Persephone was picking spring flowers, including violets, when she was abducted by Hades, god of the ancient Greek underworld. Violets were an emblem of Athens, which of course is where Midsummer Night's Dream is set. In the Middle Ages, the violet represented love that was new, uncertain, changeable or transitory, which is a theme running through the play. Later, in Victorian times, it came to signify constancy. Care must be taken when assigning meaning to Shakespeare's flowers, as the language of flowers changed and developed in the Victorian period. Woodbine can be used to describe any climbing plant, but it most commonly refers to the common honeysuckle. It grows in woodland and along hedgerows, weaving through shrubs and trees. It is common and widespread throughout the British Isles. John Bullion wrote in his Book of Simples in 1562, Oh, how sweet and pleasant is woodbine, in woods or arbours, after a tender soft rain. Flowers are produced from June to September. I am lucky to have this plant growing wild in my garden, and on warm summer evenings the smell is gorgeous. It is attractive to many species of insect, particularly butterflies, moths and bumblebees. Honeysuckle has a cooling effect and can help with fevers and flushes. It is also thought to have contraceptive properties and can act as a laxative to counteract poisons. In Of Gardens, Francis Bacon declares the musk rose second only to violets in yielding the sweetest smell in the air. The origins of the musk rose, Rosa Moschata, are unknown. It was thought to have been brought to England from Italy by Thomas Cromwell. In 1582, Hackliot gave the date of the introduction of the musk rose into England as being then quite recent. It was a much sought-after plant for Elizabethan gardeners. It is thought that the rose by Titania's bower might have been the British native Rosa arvensis, known as the field rose, which tends to grow in hedgerows and at the margins of woodland. It is a vigorous plant that will grow in most soil types. It produces a heady scent, especially in the evenings. Bees, butterflies and particularly moths are attracted to it. The photo by J. R. Crellin is taken near Llangos Lake. Field rose, or Rosin Gwilltgwyn, wild white rose, flowers in June and July. The flowers and leaves of roses can be used as a cooling agent to reduce inflammation and soothe rashes. Eglantine, otherwise known as Sweetbriar, is native to England. It has an ugly scent. It has numerous thorns along its stem, and it tends to grow on the edges of pasture land. Cows are fond of the hips produced after the flowers fall, thus providing natural fertilizer for the rose seeds. Natural fertilizer for the rose seeds. Although relatively rare in England, it has become a pest in New Zealand and other countries with the right climate and less natural pests and competitors. The modern English rose, Eglantine, bred by David Austin for its strong old David Austin for its strong old rose scent and large exquisitely formed blooms, is my favourite rose in the rose garden. I couldn't resist putting my photo of it here. Quoting from Julia's Edible Weeds blog, referring to the flowers in A Midsummer Night's Dream, she says, It turns out Shakespeare was very familiar with the wild flowers and folklore of his hometown of Stratford-upon-Avon in Warwickshire. So did Shakespeare become familiar with these flowers in Warwickshire, or somewhere else? If we look at the distribution of these plants, using the online atlas of British and Irish flora, we can perhaps get a pattern of where these plants normally flower. So here we have the map. This purple dot signifies Stratford-upon-Avon. So I haven't included the honeysuckle here because it grows absolutely everywhere, so it doesn't help us pinpoint where Shakespeare has seen these plants. The green spots show us have been seen since 2020. The red spots 
show us where the plants had been seen from 2000 to 2020. So we can see that the wild thyme is pretty common up in Scotland, north of England, and is quite common down in the south of England here. Now, in this area, in the Midlands, particularly in Stratford-upon-Avon, it's not very common at all. If we then go to the sweet violet, the sweet violet tends to prefer warmer conditions. So you can see it growing more commonly in the south. And then it becomes less common as we go further north. I've included a graph here of global temperature change in the last thousand years. Now we can see that there was a minimum temperature in 1600, known as the Little Ice Age. Some of the plants that prefer warmer temperatures are only going to be seen in the areas of southern England, and they're going to become more rare as you go further north. Eglantine has a scattered distribution. It's not very common, but you can see that it is fairly scattered. But again, it prefers warmer conditions, so it would probably be more likely to be seen further south. Now, oxlip is a fussy little plant. It likes growing in chalky areas, chalky areas, or calciferous areas, but it does like a wet environment, so it's not going to grow on the dry chalk like the wild thyme. The fen violet is quite rare now. It prefers wet environments and a lot of its habitat. It would have been far more common in Shakespeare's time. But again, it prefers an alkali soil. So I've included here a geological map of Great Britain. Looking at the southwest part of England, the cream area here are the newer rocks. They tend to be mudstones and siltstones. And then the green area here, that tends to be the Cretaceous chalk that form the White Cliffs of Dover on the south coast. Then moving further northwest, we get the Jurassic rocks, the phosphoriferous limestones. And then the pink area here tends to be the Triassic stones. They're red sandstones and mudstones, often formed in desert environments. So it's this area here in the pink where you don't tend to get much limestone or alkaline soils. So we can see that even though these plants have lost some of their habitats through drainage of the land, through urbanisation, and agriculture. They do prefer an alkaline soil. They prefer growing in chalky areas or limestone areas. So a lot of these plants would be very unlikely to be found in Stratford-upon-Avon. Let's zoom in and see where we think Shakespeare might have seen these plants. Here we have a map of the south of England showing London. I'm going to superimpose the geological map so that you can see where the different rocks underlie the different areas around London. If we start with the wild thyme distribution, we can see that it's mainly above the chalky areas here, so it tends to grow on the heathland. When we look at the eglantine distribution, we can see that it's mainly in this area, overlying the newer rocks, the gravels and London clays. The oxlip distribution tends to be around Suffolk. And finally, you can just see a few little fern violets dotted around here and there. When I first started research into Tanya's flowers, I thought that Shakespeare must have had a particular spot in mind. In the countryside, at the edge of a wood, where a stream winds its way through the limestone chalky landscape. But I've come across a sticking point. 
you might have noticed that I've missed a plant out. All the plants are wild plants native to England, apart from the musk rose. Of course, Shakespeare may have made a substitution. He may have meant the field rose and called it the musk rose. But I'm going to go on the premise that Shakespeare doesn't make mistakes. He likes his details to be accurate. Musk roses are mentioned three times in A Midsummer Night's Dream. If Shakespeare had meant the native field rose, I think he would have said so. The musk rose was a popular, much sought-after plant. It would have been found in some of the best gardens in the country. So we look for a garden of a country house, with limestone walls where stream flows between the woodland and the pasture land. So we've got a list of some of the houses in the area. I'm only going to refer to the ones which were renowned for having beautiful gardens. Polymath and statesman Francis Bacon, thought by some to be the writer of the works of Shakespeare, was a great observer and recorder of nature. He starts his essay of gardens. God Almighty first planted a garden, and indeed it is the purest of human pleasures. It is the greatest refreshment to the spirits of man, without which buildings and palaces are but gross handiworks. The ruins of the house and water gardens are all that remain today in the grounds of the new estate. Curtling Hall was built by the architect Francis Adams for Edward North between 1556 and 1558. The house included contemporary Tudor features such as a gatehouse, gallery, lodgings, a banqueting hall and a garden complete with grand water features and ponds. During her summer progress to Cambridge in 1578, Queen Elizabeth stayed there for three days. In work done by Dennis McCarthy, it has been found out the translation of Plutarch's Lives was possibly used in A Midsummer Night's Dream. It was at Wanstead Hall that the Queen's favourite, or soon to be former favourite, Robert Dudley, married Lettice Knowles behind the Queen's back. It was the French ambassador, Simier, who let slip the news to the Queen. More about this in a moment. There was a rivalry between Robert Dudley and William Cecil over who could produce the best garden for the Queen's enjoyment. But I think the gardens at Tibbles rivalled any in the land. Theobald's house, known as Tibbles, was the palatial country residence of William Cecil. He bought the manor house in 1563 and had built a palace by 1583. John Gerard who was employed as head gardener, was influenced by the gardens at Fontainebleau. The gardens depicted on the frontispiece are likely to be Tibbles. On a visit for the Queen to Tibbles in May 1591, the gardener gives a speech. In the first I framed a maze, not of hyssop and thyme, but all the virtues, all the graces, all the muses, winding and wreathing about your majesty. All this not of pot herbs, but of flowers, and of flowers fairest and sweetest. The virtues were done in roses, the graces of pansies, the muses of nine several colours. These mingled in a maze. Then I was commanded to place an arbour all of Eglantine. Most gardens at this time were kitchen gardens or herb gardens. When the gardener says, a maze not of hyssop and thyme, he is probably referring to Mediterranean thyme used in cooking. The gardener has chosen the most fragrant flowers for the queen. Shakespeare chose the most fragrant flowers for Titania's bower. It is not known who wrote the gardener's speech. It is thought to be in the hand of Edward de Vere's secretary, John Lilly. It is common knowledge that there was no love lost between Edward de Vere and his father-in-law William Cecil. We don't know how much time de Vere spent at Tibbles, but two of his daughters were born there. There is a record of de Vere meeting the Queen there in 1583, in reconciliation of his former misdeeds. An important meeting with the Queen is on record, but you would hardly expect every visit to the in-laws to be a matter of public record. 
I can imagine that de Vere, who was a bit of a hothead, might have escaped to the garden after an argument at dinner, wandering along the banks of the waterways and sitting under a canopy of eglantine. The house is set in parkland, where the river Lee cuts through the chalk which lies beneath the London clay. Tibbles is a perfect location and habitat for Oberon's assemblage of plants. Gerard says in his herbal, Conserve or syrup made of the musk rose in a manner as before told in the damask and red roses doth purge very mightily waterish humours yet safely and without all danger taking in the quantity of an ounce in weight. In 2015, Mark Griffiths realised that the frontispiece of John Jarrett's herbal shows the four men that helped in its creation. He identified the fourth man as Shakespeare, Apollo, holding Aidan's flower in one hand and maize in the other. If you want to know more about this identification, please see Alexander War's video, John Gerard New, which I will link below in the comments. There is no record that William of Stratford ever visited Theobald's, or in fact any of the other stately homes in the area. Prior to Elizabethan times, gardens were utilitarian. The first mention of a garden for pleasure was Cardinal Wolsey's garden at Hampton Court. During the religious wars, many refugees fled from the Low Countries and settled in East Anglia and South East England, bringing with them the knowledge of horticulture. It was then in the late 1500s interesting gardens for pleasure grew. Botanists explored the countryside, collecting seeds and plants to bring back to their gardens. So it is likely that these gardens would contain all the flowers of Titania's bar. William Coyes was one of the first plantsmen in England to plant a botanical garden at his home, Stubbers, in Essex. His plants and seeds formed the basis for the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, which was on the estate of Queen Elizabeth's Palace at Richmond. His garden at Stubbers was well known to Gerard prior to the publication of the Herbal. Matthias de Lobel was one of the fathers of botany, alongside Carolus Clusius and Rembert Dodorans. Lobel first came to England in 1566, possibly fleeing religious persecution. It was while he was living in London he became friends with John Gerard. In 1571, he set off with his friend Pierre Panna on a botanical exploration of England, before returning to the Low Countries. When he returned to England in 1596, he became superintendent of Lord Zouche's botanical garden in Hackney. The Physic Garden in Hackney was one of the few in existence in England at the time, and it became an important meeting place for botanists from the continent. Lord Zouche's house was ten, was ten minute walk from Edward de Vere's house, King's Place, in Hackney. In 1570, Lord Souche, at the age of 14, was made a ward of William Cecil, alongside Edward de Vere. They both sat at the trial of Mary, Queen of Scots, so they would have been well acquainted with each other, but nothing is known of their personal relationship. James I gave Robert Cecil Hatfield House in exchange for Tibbles, in 1607, long after Midsummer Night's Dream was published. I could find no details of the gardens prior to this. As contemporary historian William Camden put it, the French aristocrat, Jean Simier, was most skilled in love toys, pleasant conceits and court dalliances. The Queen was transformed into a radiant young woman again, it was rumoured among the courtiers that he had been giving the Queen love potions. Oberon asks Pack to place the love potion on Titania's eyes, and whatever she sees first, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or on busy ape, she would fall in love with it. Elizabeth called Simier 
a monkey or ape. A play on the word Simeon. In Mother Hubbard's tale, Spencer refers to Simeon as ape. If you remember, it was Simeon who told the Queen that her favourite, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, who she affectionately called her Robin, had secretly married. It might be a bit of a stretch, but Robin Starveling is a pun on Robin, out of favour, starving for the Queen's affection. It was rumoured that Robert Dudley, annoyed at Simier, tried to poison him. The Duc d'Alençon was called Monkey by his brother. If you want to know more about how the Duc d'Alençon and French ambassadors are lampooned in a Midsummer Night's Dream, please refer back to part one of Midsummer Night's Dream in Contacts with Claire. Golding, in his preface to Metamorphosis, describes his text as fragrant flowers most full of pleasant juice. He goes on to say that they could be beneficial or harmful, a cure or a poison. Oberon removes the effects of the love in idleness with wormwood, Artemisia absinthium. The plant is named after the Greek goddess of the hunt, Artemis, whose equivalent is Diana. In the last video I spoke about the links between Titania, Diana and Queen Elizabeth. Used as a flavouring in absinthe, it can be used as a treatment for various infectious diseases. It can cause convulsions and death, but only in very large doses. Just as an extra piece of info, during the Queen's summer progress, prior to her visit to Kirtling Manor, the Queen was provided with an entertainment. Edward de Vere's secretary, Thomas Churchard, writes about a show involving nymphs and fairies performed outside Norwich on August 22nd. It was during this progress to Cambridge that Gabriel Harvey gave a speech in which he said to the 28-year-old Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, Thy countenance shakes a spear. And finally, three dedications and Puck's final speech. I think there are similarities. Do you think they might be written by the same author? I will leave it with you to decide. Although Titania's bower is an imaginary place, and may only have existed in the author's imagination, I think that I have provided you with enough evidence to dispute the myth that it was inspired by countryside walks in Warwickshire. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed finding out more about a midsummer night's dream. Up next will be the Tempest. If you would like to receive a notification, please press the bell icon to subscribe to my channel. Please press like and leave a comment below. And remember, please be kind.